we're glad to be sharing the ministry of Redemption Church with you. Now join us as we receive the Word of God. All right, who wants to try it and they'll like it? Who is it? It's a surprise. The first week we did cheese we, we did cheese with raspberry jam on it. The second week we did a California sushi roll, so we're not killing anybody. Try it. Come on, Sean. Sean is not a plant. All right. We believe that you're going to try it and you'll like it. Huh? All right. Three, two, one. Ah. This is red bean jelly milk ice bars from your local Asian grocery store. We are excited to try these, Sean. Sean gets a whole bar. If you'd like some after church, you may go ahead and we'll cut one up for you and give you a little piece. Sean, go ahead and open that. It's not going to be that cold because I took it out a while ago. All right. He tried it. Mm. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. How about now? Uh, all right. Well, thank you, Sean. We're glad you tried it. <laughs> Have a blessed Sunday. What's this stuff? It's Jesus. He's supposed to be good for you. Did you try it? I'm not going to try it. You try it. I'm not going to try it. Let's get Mikey. Yeah. He won't eat it. He hates everything. He likes it. Hey, Mikey! Jesus Christ is living and active at Redemption Church. We encourage you to try new things in Jesus at all times. Things like worship, things like Bible study, things like gifts of the Spirit. We believe that these things can be beneficial to your life. So try it. You'll like it. You can't say you like it until you've tried it. And we break this rule all the time because we all the time will say, oh, I don't like that. And then you're, you put on the spot. Someone asks, well, have you actually tried that? And they're like, no. We had that conversation uh, on text, via text with our staff. And we, I suggested anchovy pizza, pizza with anchovies. And sure enough, we had somebody on our staff, I'm not going to name him, Christy Yarbrough, who said, oh, that's gross. I don't like that. And we're like, well, have you tried anchovy pizza? And she's like, no. Let's be real. You can't really say you, you like something or dislike something until you've tried it. Thank you for trying Redemption Church today. I'm glad, glad all you're here. My name is Chris Fluid. I'm the lead pastor here. And I believe that God has something for us today. The first week, we challenge you to try faith. You're not going to like faith or dislike faith until you've tried it. You've got to try it. We told you that faith looks dumb. From the outside. From the outside, it looks totally dumb. But from the inside, as in the story of Naaman, who in his story, he tried faith. He, he dipped in the Jordan seven times. And he found out that faith, although it looked dumb from the outside, on the inside, it was powerful. Yeah. On the inside, it was miraculous. On the inside, it was everything he had ever been looking for. But he had to try it. And then last week we told you to try prayer. The life of a Christian should be marked with prayer. Prayer isn't just asking for stuff. We make that mistake all the time that, that we think prayer is asking for stuff. There is actually a much greater benefit than that. We talked about the power of agreement and how prayer, when done correctly, brings us into unity with God's kingdom and his plan. There is nothing better than being in unity with God's kingdom and his plan. Because in his kingdom, you have everything you need. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things are added unto you. There is always benefit to being in kingdom agreement. And today, we're going to challenge you to try worship. Look at somebody and say, try worship. Now look back at him and say, you'll like it. Everyone worships. Everyone worships, and there might be some people dis that disagree with that statement, but I, I stand by it all, all the same. Can we turn up the lights? I just want to see everybody, make sure I, uh, I'm not losing anybody, like y'all aren't like slipping out the back door or anything. All right. Good, y'all are still there. Whew. I was worried. 
uh, it is in humans, it is in human beings to worship or praise something. With all the world religions and philosophies, they all find an object of worship. Here are the five most popular world religions. They have the most worshipers in them. Here they are in order. Christians, they worship God in the face of Jesus. Second, Islam. Who do they worship? They worship Allah. Uh, Buddhism. Now, they, this one's tricky because they claim to not worship Buddha as God. If you ever talk to a Buddhist, they'll, they'll tell you that. But if you look at that religion, they build huge temples to who? Buddha. And they bow down before who? Buddha. And whose name do they have reverence to? The name of Buddha. Okay, so come on. Give us a break. Hindus. They have three major gods. Brahma, the creator. Vishnu, also called Krishna, the preserver. And Shiva, the destroyer. Wow. All right. Hindus also have many other gods that they worship in addition. And then uh, five right here. Sikhs. Now, Sikhs are interesting. They proclaim to worship the same God of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, but they call him Wahaguru, Wahguru, or Vaguru. I saw all those versions. So those are the top five, and past that, we have Judaism. Judaism, of course, worships Jehovah God, and then you have Satanism. We'll throw that one out there. Satanism is actually tricky because you would think Satanism would worship Satan. Satan? Old, old Saturday Night Live clip. Uh, but actually, they don't worship Satan, they worship themselves as God. If you're a Satanist, you're actually worshiping yourself. And they get that idea from Satan. Who, what did Satan do? He stopped worshiping the Most High and sought to be worshipped himself. So that's Satanism. And then atheism. You wouldn't think that an atheist would worship, right? Uh, they don't believe in God, but atheists end up going the way of humanism. They might not agree with this, an atheist, and we're, we'll, we'll hear all about it if y'all want to talk to us about it online, but they end up showing reverence for, their, for themselves, for their own thoughts, for their own actions, and they start, the, you could worship yourself in that regard. Even people that don't believe in God will end up worshiping something. You agree with that? How about materialism? I believe materialism has become a world religion. We all know people that worship politicians and politics. Yeah. Oh, my man, fill in the blank. He can do wrong wrong. He is the greatest politician ever. He is the hope for all this whole world. Hope change. That's the guy we need. You hear this like every election cycle. Don't believe the hype. Do not do it. Or how about sport teams or athletes? A, a, Last Sunday, my San Antonio Spurs, I know I live in Dallas, please forgive me, but my San Antonio Spurs brought home a championship to Texas, and I was a little bit happy about it. I worshipped a little bit, okay? Sorry, I, I, I got excited. I, I shouted a little bit. Sarah said, do not wake the babies or you're going to sleep outside. Everyone worships something. That's what we want you to know. Everyone has something that they center their life around. Worship can look differently, but it really comes to centering your life around one thing. Some people worship nature. They worship money. They worship success. They worship power. They worship science. They worship knowledge. They worship beauty. They worship popularity. They worship pleasure. You fill in the blank. There is something someone is centering their life in, and that is worship. We're created for worship. Since then, we're all created for worship. And we're all worshiping something. Wouldn't it make sense? Wouldn't it be important that we're worshiping the right thing? And we who are being, are created people, wouldn't it make sense if we were worshiping, I don't know, the creator? Are you with that idea? Is that too foreign? I want to tell you that there are many things in this world you can worship. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus is the right one to worship. Colossians 1.16 tells us this. For by him... All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things, somebody said all things, things. were created by him and for him. You want to know the right one to worship? It's the one that created everything. Everything was created by him and for him. I'm here to tell you today, Jesus, that's who you ought to worship. Don't worship something that doesn't give you life. 
Jesus gives life and he gives it more abundantly. If you are worshiping something but you don't feel life coming back into you, you're worshiping the wrong thing. You're worshiping the wrong thing. I'm telling you that as you worship, you ought to feel more energy coming back at you. You ought to feel more strength coming back in you. You ought to feel more joy coming back inside of you. Let me tell you, I get that in Jesus. Anybody get that in Jesus? I get that in Jesus. It is out of your life that you're supposed to praise and worship. It's, it takes out of your life. It's a withdrawal of your strength. It's a withdrawal of your focus, your time, and your energy. And it, it's that as you worship God. Psalm 150 and 6 tells us this. It says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If you have breath, you ought to try worshiping the Lord. Why? Because where do you think your breath came from? Where did your breath come from? Genesis 2 and 7 tells us, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils. Where did that breath come from? It came, that breath of life came from the Lord. In worship, we are taking the breath that God gave us and we are turning around and returning it to the Lord. You are withdrawing from yourself back to the Creator. You're using that breath to thank him, magnify, and exalt him. Can I tell you that God deserves worship? He deserves worship. In worship, we never give something to God that he's undeserving of. Now, if you're anything like me, you'll, you'll relate to this. We have all said and done things for people that we felt deep down, if we're honest, they didn't deserve that. Maybe we're put on the spot and somebody asks, hey, uh, right in front of the other person, what do you think of this person's uh, work on the job? And you're on the spot and you're like, well, and you're in the back of your head, you're like, they, they really aren't that good of workers. But you're in that spot and you have to say, no, they're good workers. They are. They're absolutely good workers. And, and deep down you're saying, they really didn't deserve that compliment, but I was put on the spot. Anyone ever been anything like that? Uh, the rest of the staff feel that way about me all the time. You felt forced into the situation to say something nicer than that person deserved. It is never like that with Jesus. Worshiping Jesus, you never offer up more praise than he deserves. You never get to a song lyric and say, "Uh, no, he really doesn't deserve that said about him, how he's on the throne of heaven. No, No, he does deserve that and more. Everything you say about Jesus, he deserves your worship. He deserves your praise. We know what grace is. We studied a few weeks ago at Connect Group. Grace is receiving what you don't deserve. That's, that's a simple way of saying it. It's receiving something you don't deserve. And, and God gives us grace. He says things about us that we just flat out don't deserve. He does things for us we flat out don't deserve. But let me tell you, you can't give God grace. Because grace is giving something that someone hasn't deserved. God has deserved everything. You can't give him grace. He he has nothing unmerited. All of it's merited with him. All of it is deserved with him. You can't give God grace. Everything we could give him, he deserves, and so much more. But here is what we can give God, worship. You're looking for something to give God, give him worship. Because God deserves worship. You might be listening listening to this and, and saying, well, I worship already. Get off my back already, Pastor Chris. I, I worship already. So this sermon's obviously not for me. It's probably for that person over there. I didn't see them clapping during that last song. I want to show you a challenging scripture, okay? Because this sermon's for everyone that has breath today. Okay. Psalm 150 and 2 says this. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. All right, I want you to get this. How much does God deserve worship? He deserves all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. We studied that last year. It's called the Shema, remember? It's called the Shema. He deserves all these things. And here it says to praise him for his acts of power. Are you aware of his acts of power? Are you in this place and you are aware that God created the world? We could start with what we see. God created all that we see. If you are aware of that, you should worship him. 
If God has ever done something in your heart, something in your life, and you've been witness, maybe you've seen someone healed, maybe you've been forgiven, maybe, whatever it is, if you have been exposed to that, you should praise him for that. Praise him for his acts of power. So that, that should be challenging right there, but it goes even more. It says, praise him for his surpassing greatness. I want you to get this. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. You should praise God at the level of his surpassing greatness. In the King James Version, it says you should praise him according to his excellent greatness. You see, if you have a great God, you should give him great praise. Does that make sense? You praise him according to his excellent greatness, for his surpassing greatness. So how great you think God is, you should praise him according to that level. All right, now, so now that's challenging. Because that means if you believe God is the greatest of all time, you should be bringing him the greatest of all time worship and praise. How's that for a challenge? Does that challenge the level of your praise? Do you think you'll ever master that? No, you'll never master that. The commitment, the passion, the energy, and the heart, that's the greatness and the level that you should be giving to him to match his greatness. We should attempt to have our praise match the level of his greatness. Let me tell you, that means we should never just go ho-hum through another worship service. That means you should never let another day go by where you aren't actively seeking to honor the name of Jesus Christ. Does your praise and worship paint the picture of God's greatness? Does it? Psalm 48 and 1 says this, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. He's great and greatly to be praised. Now the truth is that none of us fully comprehend the greatness of God, do we? Every time you think you understand how great he is, he shows up in a brand new way and blows us all away. He does it all the time. But still, we should feel challenged to give worship that is commensurate, that is equivalent, that is comparable with his glory. You should live with that challenge every day. Psalm 29 and 2 says this, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Get that, do his name. You receive a bill in the mail and there is something that's coming due and you have to give that amount to them. Well, here's the glory of his name and you should give that praise back to him in that amount. No wonder we're going to be worshiping him in heaven forever because we're never going to be done worshiping his glorious name. This means we should be giving some effort in worship. It's not enough just to show up to a worship service. You need to be giving something due his name. You shouldn't just go through the motions. You should be trying to praise him according to his excellent greatness. But I don't feel like worshiping today. We've heard that before. Maybe we felt that before. Maybe we've said that before. If not out loud, maybe we've thought it before. I've been I've been I've been there. I'm I'm honest with you, okay? I'm I'm there with you. But let me tell you, we don't worship according to our feelings. We worship according to his excellent greatness. We don't worship according to our bank account. Because that fluctuates, that goes up and down. But God's greatness, oh my goodness, it's unchanging. Or according to Uh, We don't worship according to there being more good news than bad news. We don't worship according to that. We praise according to his greatness. Can I tell you that we worship beyond circumstance? And we got all kinds of different people in this house, and you all came from different circumstances. I want to tell you that your worship should go beyond circumstance. There are times where we feel we might not uh, feel like worshiping, There are times where God doesn't feel as near to us as the problems that we face. You ever been there? You feel like your problem is right here and God is way back there. You ever been there? You ever been there? But we are to, as Psalm 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. No matter the closeness and the proximity of my problems, I should praise the Lord, bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall 
sometimes be in my mouth. No, continually be in my mouth. There is never a time. You can't find the moment where you shouldn't be worshiping him. All right? You can't find the day where he doesn't deserve that. At all times, we're blessing his name. All times, his praise is in our mouth. Even when life isn't easy, you can worship God. Is there any witness in the house that even when life isn't easy? I, I want to tell you. There have been times in my life where life wasn't easy, but I walked into the house of God and I just got away from my problems for a second and worshiped and everything changed. I entered into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise and then everything changed. It was, it was glorious. Miracles have happened in my life with stuff like that and, and it, you know, it put everything in perspective and, and I found peace and I found joy. Now, I'm probably talking to more than one person right now that needs to hear this. So listen up. You're facing problems you don't have answers for. And you might be tempted to not give praise to God during these times because, well, I got all these problems. I'll praise him afterwards. I'll praise him when the miracle happens. I'm going to tell you, you should try it anyway. It goes against logic because you usually pay people after they've done something for you. But, but worship doesn't work that way. Worship becomes before. Try worshiping in the middle of your struggle. Try worshiping in the middle of your pain. I'm here to tell you today, if you try it, I think you'll like it. In Acts 16, we hear a story. And you need to hear this story today. Maybe you don't know it. Paul and Silas were on a missionary journey. And they were preaching the gospel of Jesus, and they were seeing miracles happen. All kinds of wonderful, powerful things were happening. But guess what? They, they work a miracle that makes some people angry. They get so mad at them because they delivered a woman from a demon, and that demon helped the woman uh, do fortune-telling and tell the, the future. And the people that, uh, around this woman, they were angry because... Uh, the woman that could predict the future and help them, uh, she, she no longer had that access to that fortune-telling spirit. And suddenly they saw the power they had over others. They saw uh, the, the ability to make money dishonestly with this thing go away. And they were mad about it. Yeah. None of them were happy that she was delivered from the spirit. They were all angry. So they take their anger out on Paul and Silas. And they, were, they took Paul and Silas and they stripped them of all their clothes. And they beat them. And they threw them in a jail cell. Does that sound bad yet? Sound like a bad situation yet? Anyone want to trade places with Paul and Silas? No. And they even put their feet in stocks. So they're like these things. So you put them in there and you can't move. So they're totally restricted. Not only they're, they're, they're naked, beaten, thrown in stocks in the middle of jail. Their movement is limited This is a bad situation. Do I have you all talked in that, yes, Chris Fluitt, this is a bad situation? Good. This is a bad circumstance, but are we to worship God beyond circumstance? See, they're in the middle of pain. They're in the middle of struggle. They're in the middle of humiliation. And they have no clue how they're going to get out of this. We, when we read this story, we don't find a place where an angel comes down and says, Lo and behold, the Lord will deliver you in 12 minutes Nothing like that. There's no angel. They have, there's no word from God that they're going to be okay. For all they know, they, they could end the rest of their life in the jail cell or be killed at dawn. Either one is just as likely logically. Talk about bad circumstances. What do you think they would do in a situation like this? What would you do in a situation like this? Well, it makes sense that they would pray. And they did pray. It makes sense that they might be angry at God. I've been angry at God before when things aren't going the way I think they ought to go. Here we are, we're trying to serve you and you let this happen. God, ah! What would you do in a situation like this? Well, Paul and Silas show us how to worship beyond circumstance. Acts 16, 25, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. And sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Now, wait, pause. 
So what do they do? They pray and they sing praise to God. And they do it so quietly no one can hear them. They, they are really inwardly and just really shy about it. You know, this is a very personal experience with Jesus. So they prayed really quietly and, and praised the Lord quietly, right? No. Y'all don't agree with that. Why do you not agree with that? The prisoners heard them. The people in the jail cell heard them. Yeah. Okay. It's all right if people hear you praising and worshiping God. Okay? It's all right. Verse 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaking. And immediately all the doors were open. How many of the doors were open? All of the doors were open. This is crazy. And everyone's bands were loose. Who, whose bands were loosed? Everyone. Now, this is a crazy picture here because they're in one jail cell in stocks, just the two of them. And they start worshiping God. But whose doors open? Everyone's doors open. Whose chains fall off? Everyone's chains fall off. See, that's the power of worship. You can be in an atmosphere of worship, and I can be, yeah, that's just how God works. When he shows up, he shows up suddenly. He shakes everything up. And while they're praying and they're worshiping, everyone finds some freedom. See, there's some freedom in worship. And it all happens in the middle of prayer and worship. While they were singing songs of praise to God, the entire circumstance changed. Redemption Church, can I remind you, God changes circumstances. He changes circumstances. Can I remind you that he can change the painful situation that's on your mind? Can I remind you that chains fall off, prison doors are opened by the God that we serve? Why should you worship God in the middle of your circumstance? Because the God you serve changes circumstance. Blind eyes opened, cancerous tumors mysteriously vanish. Shelton Mono, they vanish. Yeah. Jesus' name. He's praying for his mom. She's got tumors. We're agreeing right now in Jesus' name. Those tumors are gone because the God we worship. The dead are raised back to life because the Lord of heaven and earth comes on the scene. Can I remind you of that? Why do we worship beyond circumstance? Because we serve a God who changes circumstance. In the middle of jail, while you're chained up, you can worship. Paul and Silas worship God. And God came and shook the foundations and every prison door opened. Redemption Church, worship God. Don't let circumstance stop you from worshiping God the Lord. All right. But you might be thinking, worship is weird. Worship is weird. I won't argue with you because from the outside looking in, definitely worship looks weird. Remember, you can't like something until you've, tried it. thank you. If you've never tried it, it, it might make you feel a little nervous even being in the room with it, with worship going on. I, I can understand that. Biblical forms of worship might even seem strange. You got bowing down, laying face down, hands lifted, clapping your hands, singing, shouting, dancing, leaping, laughter, crying, praising him in song, praising him with instruments. We can understand how some of that would look weird. Out of that list, there might be something that just totally makes you uncomfortable. We get that. No one's uh, you know, being mean to you because you feel that way. Perhaps you are even just really uncomfortable with the topic of worship. And you're ready to just kind of walk away from the entire subject by saying, I don't like worship. I would ask, have you tried it? I don't like lifting my hands. Well, have you tried it? I really don't. I don't think I would like crying before the Lord or, or, or kneeling before him. Well, have you tried it? I think if you try it, you'll like it. I want to invite you to try it today. Um, some might say, I worship inwardly. This is all well and good, Pastor, but I worship kind of on the inside. You know, I just keep to myself. You know, I think God hears uh, what I'm saying, and I don't have to do all that, let's face it, silly stuff. 
All right, that can be you today. And if that's you, you're still welcome here. You can worship God silently. We love you. You're just totally welcome here. But can I tell you that worship starts on the inside? But it should show up on the outside. I believe that with all my heart. And so does Peter. First Peter 2 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Look at somebody say, he's talking about you, peculiar people. That you should what? Shew forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That you should show forth the praises of him. You see, it starts on the inside, but it should show up on the outside. To show forth in the Greek, in the Greek is ex, exog, exagalo, exagelo. I got it eventually. It's hard to say Greek, so give me a break. Exagelo. And it means to tell out. It doesn't mean to tell in, like we're just talking to ourselves and, oh, oh, there's people coming. I better be quiet. No, it means to tell it outwardly. You see, what starts on the inside should come out. And it also means this, to make known by praising God. Or proclaiming to celebrate. Does your praise make known to everyone around you that you love Jesus? Does your praise tell everyone around you that man, this guy thinks God is really something? Is that you? Is that your praise? That, that's what your praise should do. That's how you show forth the praise of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Does that describe your worship? Is worship coming out of you so that others can see it? Is your worship a celebration? We're drawing to a close. Worship is both natural and supernatural. It's both. It's not either or, it's both. Worship is physical. It is natural. Clapping your hands, singing, dancing, all of those are physical things. In fact, people do these physical things when their favorite sport team scores, Antonio Spurs. Those are physical things. There is a physical aspect to worship. There is a natural aspect to worship. It needs to be more than a mental exercise. It must be physical. It ought to be more than you standing in a church service. It ought to go further than that. It ought to go further than you're just sitting here just thinking. It's got to go further than that. You need to put some physical in your worship. You need to put some energy, some passion in your worship. But worshiping God goes beyond the physical. Worship goes beyond the natural. Worship is also supernatural. Yes, it is. The physical act of clapping your hands isn't anything special by itself. Clapping your hands won't make it out of this room. Everyone clap your hands for just like five seconds. <laughs> they did not hear you on the other side of Plano, Texas. That clapping of your hands did not even make it out to the road. That's just physical. But when you clap your hands unto the Lord, it becomes more than just a physical act. It becomes worship. And it's supernatural. And not only does it fill this room, it reaches heaven's throne. You talk about a distance. That's what worship does. It's supernatural. I'm going to ask the musicians to come. The Bible is very clear that praise should be a part of every battle. Every battle that you're facing, whatever circumstance you came in here today, worship should be a part of your battle. God would request that the tribe of Judah go up first. Bible scholars, what does the name Judah mean? It means praise. When we're in battle, send Judah, send praise up first. And at the battle of Jericho, as they shouted and blew trumpets, it is when they shouted and blew trumpets that the, that the walls came down. They didn't come down before that. They came down as they worshipped. And on another occasion, there's so many occasions in the Bible, there's just a few. I really like this one, though. There's two huge armies. The tribe of Judah is facing not only one army, but two armies. And just one of the armies would outnumber them, but now they've got two numbers, two armies that would outnumber them, the Moabites and the Ammonites, and they surrounded Judah. There's no way out, Judah. You're dead meat. 
everyone was worried because they didn't have an army that could match their foe. So King Jehoshaphat, he prays, and guess what he does? He sends out the Navy SEAL team, Team 6, and they just one by one snipe those people and... Is that not what? He takes the greatest warriors and injects them with steroids, and now suddenly they are, no, no, that's not what, you know what he sends out? He sends out a choir. He sends a choir out to a battle. Read it, it's in, it's in your Bible. King Jehoshaphat sings the choir. And you know their weapons? Here, their, here are their weapons. They sang these words. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. And while they are singing that to praise God, God obliterates, defeats both armies. There's no, no one left to attack Judah. God did that during worship. Maybe you've been fighting your battles the wrong way. Maybe you've been fighting the wrong way. Maybe you should send a choir out. Does worship sound supernatural to you yet? All these stories have one thing in common. God wins the victory in every one of them, but he does it as people are worshiping. Do you need victory today? Do you need a miracle today? Whatever it is you are facing in life, I want you to try worshiping the giver of victory, God. Worship him. Do you want the supernatural to happen in your life? Try worship. Do you want victory today? Worship the God who gives us the victory. You see, when you worship, you're worshiping that God who gives that. You aren't worshiping and saying, I really like this church. I'm going to worship. I really like this worship leader. I'm going to worship. I really like the vibe in this place. I'm going to worship. It's not what it's about. It's about worshiping the God who gives you exactly what you need. The worship of God who's always brought you through the valley of the shadow of death. He's, he's always been with you. Now we're going to open up this altar just like we do every time we come together. We do those three things. We worship God together. We receive the word of God together. And then we talk to God together. We're going to talk to God. And if you want prayer, we're going we're to gladly pray with you. You let us know you want us to pray for you by just coming in the first two feet of this altar you don't come in the first two feet, no one is going to bother you, all right? But can I challenge you today, whether you need prayer or not, to come to this altar today and try worship. Maybe there's some places you've never gone in worship. You've never allowed yourself to go. I want you to try it today. Maybe you'll like it. Can I challenge you to worship God with more energy, to worship him with more passion and more heart? Maybe you've never worshipped him outwardly. Maybe that's your thing. I dare you to try it today. I dare you to just close your eyes. No one's going to be looking to you. Nobody's going to listen to you. Why don't you just sing? Why don't you sing and not care about the words? You can get the words wrong and God still loves your worship. You can get the pitch wrong. God still loves the worship. Maybe you've never lifted your hands. Maybe you've never lifted your voice. Maybe you've never let yourself get emotional. I challenge you to do that today. Why don't you come do that? Thank you for joining us. For more information about redemption, look us up online at redemption-church.com and be sure to connect with us on Facebook and Twitter.